You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to rollermartinunfiltered.com. You can make this possible. Yesterday, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, the president-elect and the VP-elect, both met with civil rights leaders uh, to discuss a variety of issues, including his cabinet appointments and his agenda when he becomes president. During the meeting, the groups touched on racial equity, social justice, and increased diversity in the Biden-Harris cabinet. Now, uh, of course, we talked about this on yesterday, uh, about this very thing. Now, in an interview prior to meeting with them, Biden said, quote, their job is to push me and my job is to keep my commitment and make the decision. Joining me now is NAACP President Derek Johnson. Derek, glad to have you on Roller Martin Unfiltered. First off, um, sure. Um, we, we, we look at uh, news coming out that he is going to name uh, Congresswoman Marsha Fudge as Secretary of HUD. Today, of course, unveiling uh, retired Force Star General Lloyd Austin as his Secretary of Defense and mm -hmm. uh, picking Tom Vilsack to head the USDA. And then, of course, we're still waiting for the uh, other cabinet positions. So far, how would you assess uh, the picks being made for not only administration jobs, but also cabinet uh, level jobs by the Biden Harris White House? Uh, too early to tell. Uh, we have another 10 or so cabinet positions to be selected. There are over uh, 4,000 uh, appointments to be made. Only about 1,300 uh, require Senate confirmation. And so we are early in the process. As an organization, we want to make sure uh, we set a cadence uh, uh, in terms of our conversation. Uh, for us, it's more about the policy priorities. Uh, so no matter who is selected, there is a clear uh, accountability dealing with uh, racial equity, something that he said that he will be accountable for. Uh, and when you talk about him being accountable for racial equity, you talk about this uh, position uh, that was mentioned yesterday when it comes to racial equity. Absolutely. You know, if if you say uh, one of the four pillars of his administration would do a racial equity, then we want a follow through on that commitment. I th we think it's a good thing. It's a forward-looking approach. And uh, the only way to make sure that happens is create a portfolio that somewhat manage that portfolio to ensure racial equity goes across all departments. Very similar to what he did with climate, which is another pillar. He created a post for a climate uh, envoy uh, that, that's a direct advisor to him to address issues of climate. We want the same thing for racial equity. Uh, but is that necessary? But, but when you talk about a, a, a particular position, or, or, or is that really about, um, again, an individual who has the authority uh, to execute um, what needs to be happening. I, I think about uh, Bob Brown. Bob Brown, of course, served uh, in the Nixon administration. He was an MLK to, excuse me, he was a lieutenant to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. before going to the Nixon administration. Go to my iPad, please. This is a cover of his book. Uh, that is, uh, You Can't Go Wrong Doing Right, How a Child of Poverty Rose to the White House and Helped Change the World. I interviewed Bob. Bob, of course, lives in High Point, North Carolina. I interviewed Bob. Uh, and one of the things that we talked about, he said, you have to have, uh, he said, you got to have the full backing of the president uh, to be able to get these things done. When he's serving that capacity, he's arguably uh, in history the most powerful black presidential aide. And when he met with folks, when he met with departments, when he when he when he got the four star uh, for uh, Chappie James, when we came to the MBDA, um, they it was made perfectly clear. Nixon says what Bob wants, Bob gets. That's how it has to get done. Biden has to give that type of authority uh, to someone to make these things happen. And that's the, why this position must report directly to the president. It has to be accountable to the president, and it must be a person who's carrying out the vision of the president that's clearly defined and that all departments and cabinet posts uh, should adhere to. Racial equity is not about one cabinet versus another. It is the, uh, everything that's done within this administration writ large. And in order for that to be effective, someone must hold that portfolio. Someone must be accountable for some outcomes that are measurable. And the outcomes that are measurable are directed through the West Wing from the president's office 
uh, uh, and this person is holding that portfolio? Is it a direct report to the president? So, uh, so with, uh, we look at uh, Congressman Cedric Richmond, who's going to be over the Office of Public, Public Engagement. He was uh, a part of this conversation yesterday. Uh, would that not be his portfolio? Would that not be something uh, to do? Or is this something separate? No, this is separate. I think uh, Cedric Richmond is an advisor to the president. Uh, he brings much more in terms of skills, knowledge, and relationships. Uh, if that, if his position becomes that, then that's the discretion of the president. We are saying that there needs to be a specific person who uh, is responsible for racial equity. That's the request. And what was the response? It was an ongoing conversation. There were uh, no uh, response or demand. This is the first of several conversations that we will be having around a myriad of topics. This is the request from the NAACP. There were conversations about all facets of the administration. And how do we establish an ongoing dialogue to make sure we are providing an opportunity to give input as he also share uh, progress of the administration? Uh, earlier today, uh, he unveiled his pick for the Pentagon, that is, retired four-star General Lloyd Austin. Folks, if y'all could roll some of that video, no need to play the audio mm -hmm. yet. And, in that, and, of course, and already uh, people on Capitol Hill uh, who are saying that, uh, that a waiver should not be granted to allow Lloyd Austin to serve as the first African-American to serve as Secretary of Defense. Of course, waivers were a waiver was given when James Mattis uh, was named by Donald Trump to be the Secretary of Defense. You have to be out of the military at least seven years. Austin retired four years ago. Uh, has the NAACP taken a position on that? Uh, do you support uh, Austin uh, becoming the Secretary of Defense? And are you calling on Democrats uh, and Republicans to grant that waiver to allow Lloyd Austin to serve? Oh, if, if he's qualified to serve in office, if we have set of precedents or providing waivers, absolutely. Uh, there is no reason why he shouldn't be treated any uh, different than uh, General Mattis when he was uh, situated in the same posture. We need individuals who can instill confidence in our armed forces. We have just witnessed uh, the, the sitting president allowing a foreign nation to take a bounty out against uh, uh, men and women who are serving in the military uh, with no repercussion. So we have to instill more confidence for individuals who are making the ultimate sacrifice to protect this nation. So I that, believe General Austin, it would be uh, a, a fine addition to the cabinet. Uh, but there, but there are Democrats uh, who, uh, first of all, about 17 of them uh, in, who voted against giving the waiver to Mattis already. Folks like Senator Elizabeth Warren has said they would not grant uh, a waiver uh, to Austin. Some people are even saying that, uh, with with this being the case, Democrats could very well uh, torpedo uh, Lloyd Austin serving as Secretary of Defense. What would that say to African Americans, uh, especially to Black folks in the military? Uh, that uh, potentially the first black secretary of defense uh, would not be able to uh, take that job because Democrats say they would not grant such a waiver, saying they believe that only a civilian should be uh, in charge of the, the Department of Defense. I think it's too early. Yeah, we have not even uh, started the new Congress. Uh, we have a special election that uh, is taking place uh, January 5th. There probably will be many more uh, conversations about this topic. And as people consider and weigh options, opinions and positions will evolve. Uh, I want to ask you also, uh, the, uh, we, we had John Boyd on the show last week with the Black Farmers Organization, National Black Farmers Association. Uh, they were vehemently against Tom Vilsack becoming uh, agriculture secretary for a second time. He served eight years under uh, President Barack Obama. Joe Biden has indicated he's going to head, name him as head of the USDA. Congressman Jim Clyburn and others, they were pushing Marsha Fudge for that particular job. She clearly she clear is getting HUD. Um, what about their concerns and are there any plans uh, for you and others uh, to meet with Vilsack to talk about uh, his role as head of the USDA when it came to, uh, you know, when it came to issues like uh, racial justice? Uh, a former uh, officer in the Office of Civil Rights on the USDA uh, released a letter saying he should not get that particular job. And John Boyd. Uh, released a letter saying that if he is going to be the nominee, he must make a firm commitment to end racism in the USDA. Well, we were out early uh, opposing the nomination of Bill Sack. We were out early, perhaps one of the first out in support of Marsha Fudge to 
uh, assume the position of Department of Ag. Department of Ag budget is about two thirds uh, food nutrition. She's, she has served as uh, chair of the subcommittee uh, uh, for child nutrition for multiple years. She understands the agencies for far too long. We have trended this agency to be an agency for large farmers and not small farmers, not addressing food nutrition. Uh, Department of Ag is almost uh, many government within the government. They have far more services than just agriculture concerns. They do home loans. Uh, they provide support for rural electric cooperative. Uh, the gamut of the uh, Department of Ag is huge. Uh, and we continue to raise the questions around this appointment. But at the end of the day, it is the discretion of the president. And as a result of that, if this is going to be the person, we must sit down and have a conversation to talk about how do we move forward? How do we address injuries of the past, whether it's Shirley Shirai, Black farmers, or how electric cooperative have excluded African Americans for fully participating in the ownership of those electric companies. Uh, there's much more room for this discussion uh, as we look forward, and it's an opportunity to make sure that his appointment come with a diverse supporting cast of de deputy uh, secretaries, among other things. Um, one of the things that uh, we haven't talked, talked to in a while here, uh, we have had, we've come out of this summer, of course, in the aftermath of the death of the murder of George Floyd. Uh, there has been a, a significant amount of energy uh, from various groups, foundations, corporations, uh, when mm -hmm. it comes to offering support uh, to various groups. Uh, how has the NAACP fared in terms of, uh, in terms of donations from various folks? And, and what are your plans uh, spending those resources, uh, and, and but not only that, holding those very companies accountable uh, when it comes to the dollars. So for instance, you know, the, like Adidas, a good perfect example. When they initially talked about they wanted to give $10 million and the, the black and white employees said they ain't good enough. The next day, they had to commit to $100 million and then commit to uh, to to hiring a certain number of black and Hispanic uh, and workers. Other people are challenging these companies when it comes to pay, when it comes to duties. The advertising industry is being targeted as well. And so, so I'm curious to know uh, how how has the NAACP been navigating these waters in terms of dollars raised, but also challenging these various companies saying it's one thing to put out, we support Black Lives Matter, but how are you actually supporting black employees? Well, the NAACP, what has been interesting, we began to see a strong uptick in support as a result of COVID and our immediate response to COVID started with a Peloton Hall meeting. That support did not start with corporations, it started with individual donations. After George Floyd, we received more support from individual dollars, uh, giving small dollar support. We were actually surprised, but yet, uh, as we continue to be more vocal over the summer, as we continue to be vocal through the election cycle, as we had a very strategic plan to uh, turn out the vote in for November, we touched over 18 million uh, people, among other things. It's really good, strong st stats. We found that our individual donor contribution outpaced some of the corporate do donations. Now, we receive a tremendous amount of support from corporate donations as well, but our mission is the same. Our mission will continue to be focused on ensuring that we improve the quality of life for African Americans in the areas that we list and fight against discrimination. Uh, we are in the midst of at least three lawsuits right now against corporations. Over the summer, we took on Facebook and we refused to take Facebook money when many other groups stood on the sideline and would not join in on the Stop Hate Profit campaign. Uh, as that, pro uh, that campaign began to pick up momentum, then others want to jump, jump in. Our mission would be the same. And under my leadership, you have seen a tremendous growth, not only in the membership of the NAACP, the presence of the NAACP. We are beginning to hire uh, a different caliber of staff uh, to come in and help reestablish the prominence of the NAACP in ways in which we have not seen us show up in at least the last 10 years. Uh, and, 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 and speaking of that, um, you know, one of the things that people are also looking at is when we talk about not just impact uh, when it comes to lawsuits, but also what's happening on the ground. So, for instance, uh, we got you know, critical races in Georgia. We've seen the folks there, Republicans are trying to change the laws there when it comes to voting because they lost uh, Joe Biden, uh, uh, beat uh, Donald Trump there in Georgia, specifically in this runoff race. Uh, how much resources are the NAACP putting on the ground to get people out? 
out to vote uh, and how is that being driven uh, there? Because, again, it's going to be all about turnout. And we're seeing Cobb County slashing in half early voting locations. DeKalb County is actually increasing theirs. Uh, but there are a lot of black people who are very concerned that Republicans are going to try to stifle the black vote. What is the NAACP specifically doing uh, to protect black voters there in Georgia? Well, there's a couple of things. So in terms of the turnout, we are coordinating with uh, Stacey Abram, NSA, and many others around a massive Get Out the Vote program. Nine counties in the state of Georgia represent 45% of the total votes. There are 159 counties there. The southeast corridor of, of Georgia are counties where we need to run up the, the turnout of rural voters. We have a very strategic approach of, of an aggressive black radio buy, an aggressive digital buy to make sure that we communicate with voters effectively. We have an aggressive uh, direct mail program of infrequent voters, the same target population that we utilized during the uh, November elections. Uh, we have a no-touch canvassing going on on the ground. We convene our local units. We have more local units in the state of Georgia than anywhere else in the country. And we have a bigger footprint than any other group in, uh, in the state of Georgia. And so because we have people in rural communities that no one else exists, we have convened many of them we're providing resources directly to them. Much of this is being coordinated with, through our state president, John Wood, uh, uh, James Woodall. But we also hired a staff person in Georgia who lives in Georgia, who's a part of the state conference to help coordinate the operation. So it is, it is a, a very robust program, along with uh, much of our election tools, such as the van and other things. So it'll be a, a robust uh, operation. And that's on one side. On the other side, we, we have a, a, a uh, brought on several attorneys to monitor the elections. We partner with both the Lawyers Committee and LDF on certain lawsuits after the this past elections. I think we filed, uh, we either intervened, filed, or, or did amicus in probably 24 of the Trump cases uh, from Michigan to Pennsylvania to Georgia to Nevada. And so our program is growing. It will continue to grow. But this Georgia election is really important, and we've actually had people sign up from outside of Georgia to do phone banking inside of Georgia. So it is a coordinated effort led from the ground up, but supported by the national office. All right, Derek, Derek Johnson, NAACP uh, CEO. We certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It's time to be smart. When we control our institutions, we win. We win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, 10, 15, 20, 30 dollars on this and keep this going. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends, go back and look at the last two weeks, especially at Roland Martin Unfiltered. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin Unfiltered to support it. Please do, because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com.